So welcome everybody to USDA, Helping Small Businesses in Small Communities. And today's panelists are Steve Mosher and Tim Smith. Now, uh, Steve is a Community Solutions Specialist for the USDA Rural Development Innovation Center Partnership Team and has been with the USDA for the past 36 years. He was raised on a dairy farm in Bentonville, Arkansas, and began his lending career when he was hired by the USDA Rural Development in 1983 as a student trainee. Steve's an honor graduate of the University of Arkansas with a Bachelor of Science degree in Agriculture Business. He is very active in his community, serving organizations such as the 4-H, the Polk County Cattlemen's Association, and the Arkansas Limousine, uh, Limousine uh, Association. He and his family have purebred uh, limousine ranch on Lake Gardnell in London, Arkansas. Now, uh, Tim Smith is a Rural Business Programs Director for the USDA Rural Development in Arkansas, and he's a native of Tuckerman, Arkansas. Tim's a graduate of the University of Arkansas at Fayetteville with a Bachelor of Science degree in Agricultural Business and a Master, Master of Science degree in Agricultural Economics. Uh, he's responsible for administering the Business and Industry Guaranteed Loan Program, the REAP Energy Program, as well as other, several other programs designed to promote economic development in rural areas. And Tim began his career with the USDA Rural Development in 1988. So we've got two very well-experienced hands at the helm today. Welcome, fellas. Uh, thank you. Good morning. Um, appreciate the opportunity to be here. This is Tim Smith. I'm going to be running through uh, uh, our first two programs that we're going to talk about, and then I'm going to hand off to Steve to uh, to present the last program, and then we'll take questions uh, afterwards for whoever uh, whoever needs to answer. Uh, I'd be happy to do that. Um, me and Steve are both located here in Arkansas. We may have some, some people online that are in a different state. Um, these are federal programs and these state, these programs apply across state lines. Um, this is gonna be the same program in Oklahoma, Missouri as it is here in Arkansas. Um, at the end, you're gonna find my contact information and um, you can always contact me if you're in a different state and I'll help you uh, to get in touch with the right person. But you can also go to the to the Rural Development website at rd.usda.gov and, and hone in on your state and there will be some links and some uh, information there on contact uh, persons in your, um, in your state as well. So uh, with that, um, just tell you just briefly a little bit about rural development. Um, we're uh, one of many agencies of the United States Department of Agriculture. The main thing that we focus on is obviously, as our name says, the rural areas of, of America. And we've got programs in rural housing and um, both single family housing and, and uh, multifamily housing, uh, providing places for people to live. We have uh, community facilities programs for small communities that may need you know, fire trucks and police cars and fire stations, police stations. Uh, you know, county jails, hospitals, um, nursing homes, uh, community centers, um, just any type of community need that a small community might have. We got a, a program of, of loans and grants that, that can help small communities. Then we have our rural, community, rural utilities programs, which uh, helps uh, small communities with, uh, you know, water and sewer, um, uh, getting, good uh, drinkable water to small rural areas and rural communities is always a challenge and and we've got loan and grant programs that, that uh, you know whose mission is to to make sure everyone in the state has good good drinking water source uh, also have programs for broadband internet access uh, you know broadband is such a important thing in our, our modern lives these days we we have programs to help areas that, that haven't been able to get broadband provided any other way. So, and then the things that we're gonna talk about today are the programs that I'm responsible for administering, which is our, our rural business and cooperative programs. All the, the programs that, that fall under that are, are programs that are, are to utilize and to uh, create jobs and strengthen our rural communities and help diversify our rural um, economy. Uh, and we, we administer multiple programs to, have, to try to, 
to reach that goal. And today we're going to be talking about three of the main programs that, that we utilize to do that. Um, now the first program, um, uh, again, loans and grants and loan guarantees that, that we utilize to, to help uh, promote these rural areas. Um, first program we're going to talk about today is our business and industry guaranteed loan program. This is a program where we partner with um, rural lenders to assist uh, businesses in, in rural areas. Um, and, you know, the the idea is that sometimes a, a small a lender in a small town might not be able to uh, to make a large loan to a to a business, but if they can come in and share risk with the uh, federal government, then then uh, they may be able to do something and again help create jobs and assist that small business or any type of size business in the rural community. Um, now, how this benefits the businesses and in, in our communities. Um, it allows that business to borrow borrow all the amounts of money that they might need. You know, uh, the small town lender might only be able to, to provide a, a certain amount of money, but it not, might not really be all the money this business is, is needing to borrow. But if they can get that loan guarantee uh, from the federal government, from the USDA, then then they can they can loan that business all the amount of the money that they need to to complete their project and to create those jobs. Another benefit is, you know, since um, you know, the bank is uh, sharing the risk with the uh, federal government, they may be able to offer that business uh, a better interest rate. They may be able to offer uh, longer terms. You know, a lot of times uh, the banks like to, uh, they might give a business a 15 or 20 year term on a loan, but they want to do it with a, a three year balloon where that note comes up to be reviewed every one or two or three years. and you, you, you know, when when that loan comes up for review, there's always uncertainty because, you know, people at the bank may change, the bank may sell to a different bank, and, and you know, the new people involved may not want to renew that loan at the end of those three years. But with that, our business and industry guarantee, we lock in that 15-year term or that 20-year term, um, you know, and so it's that the business knows, hey, I my loan's in place, I know what my payment's going to be, I know what my interest rate's going to be, and I'm set for the long term. So that's that's a valuable asset for that business to have. It also makes capital available, which where it might not otherwise be able to, you know, give it, uh, gives the bank an opportunity to say yes to a deal where otherwise they may have been able, had to say no to, to a proposal. Um, what's our guarantee, our business industry guarantee do for the lender? Well, it reduces their risk. Again, if they're sharing 80% of that risk with the federal government, then you know that significantly reduces their um, their um, the amount of exposure that they incur. So they're able to to look at a bit deal a little bit more favorably. Um, it also helps them with their lending limit restrictions. This is especially important for small banks, which you know their regulators may have lending limit restrictions. They can only loan so much money in a certain sector of the market or, or whatnot. Well, with the, a government guarantee, only the unguaranteed portion of a loan uh, counts against their lending limit restrictions. So it lets that small bank make a lot larger loan than they otherwise might be able to make. It also gives that bank access to the secondary market. Really doesn't affect the small business, but um, the bank, if they won't want to, they can go out and sell that loan in the secondary market, the guaranteed portion of the loan in the secondary market, get their funds back where they have that money to relend again. So it's just another opportunity for the for the lender to uh, to use that tool to to help further their goals as a bank as a lender. Now, as far as the guarantee, the percentage of guarantees is concerned. Um, you know, the maximum guarantee on a loan of $5 million or less, an 80% guarantee. Um, on a loan between $5 and $10 million, we're talking about a 70% guarantee. And a loan from $10 million all the way up to $25 million is a 60% guarantee. Uh, you know, for smaller businesses, you know, they may need 250000 instead of $5 million or $2 million. That's fine. There, there is no minimum 
um, amount of loan that we can do a guarantee on. But uh, so we see a lot of, or we do see loans in the you know 150,000, 300,000, 500,000 dollar range. That's fine. Um, it mainly, it comes down to you know what the lender is comfortable with going ahead and going through the process of applying for the guarantee. Um, and then obviously those are the, the maximums that we just covered as well. Uh, now, um, we keep talking about rural and rural areas. Well, for our business programs, rural uh, is a pretty large number. We're talking about a population size of 50,000 or less. It's what we're gonna consider to be rural. So in Arkansas, for example, that's the entire state except for about five areas. You know, the area of Little Rock and Jonesboro and Conway and Fort Smith and then the Fettville, Springdale, Bentonville uh, metropolitan area up there. But other than that, in those areas, um, the rest of the state, you know, we can do a loan guarantee anywhere in the state. So um, if you happen to be located in a, a location that's fairly close to one of the, the large areas I just mentioned, we have a website where you can just put in the address of a particular location and it'll pop up and tell you real quickly, this is an eligible area, this is not an eligible area. Sometimes it can get down to what side of the street a business is located on that will determine uh, you know, whether or not the business is eligible. It's simply because the, the, uh, the lines are, are designated by uh, census tracts. So again, you know, the left side of the road may be eligible, the right side wouldn't be. So it's just real important to, to look on that um, eligible map to, uh, to determine if a, if a project is eligible or not. <clears throat> now the business and industry guaranteed loan is eligible for any type of business, basically. It can be an individual or it can be a partnership, it can be a cooperation or a cooperative. It can be Indian tribes and public bodies. Uh, the the requirement is that it be for a business purpose. So um, so as long as a public body, a city, or a, um, a county could could apply for a loan, as long as the needs were for some type of business purpose. So um, so really, there's not many restrictions or any restrictions on the type of um, borrower that we would we would have in the program. As far as the eligible loan purposes. Um, you know, we have working capital, uh, machinery and equipment, uh, buildings and real estate. Um, we have debt refinancing. Uh, so any type of, that's practically any type of use of, of funds right there is gonna fall in one of those categories with the, um, um, it went the wrong direction. All right, the, the things that we can't do we can't do an, a line of credit. So um, so we can do a permanent working capital loan, but we can't do a revolving line of credit or any type of line of credit. That's that's the, the big restriction that we have with our program. Uh, we don't do agriculture production because there's another agency in USDA, the Farm Service Agency. They do all the agriculture lending for, uh, uh, for the Department of Agriculture. So we stay away from that. We can't do projects that are going to transfer employment from one area to another. So if a, you know, if a company was wanting to locate across state and they were looking for a guaranteed loan to do that, and the fact that they were going to move their business from from one area to another area 200 miles away, that they were going to move 200 jobs, uh, we would not finance that. Uh, we wouldn't be able to do that project because it's transferring employment uh, from one area to other. A few other minor things we can't do. We can't do golf courses or gambling establishments or racetracks. That's that's the no list. Um, you know, the projects that we do see, we see a, a lot of manufacturing projects, a lot of retail projects. We see, um, we finance a lot of hotels and motels, or convenience stores and gas stations. Really, any type of business that you can think of um, would be eligible to be uh, to to participate in this program. There's, uh, you know, other than that small list we just went over, then, then any type of business past that would be an eligible project. So, so pretty wide, pretty diverse. <clears throat> as far as, um, you know, the terms on the loan that we can do, um, you know, working capital can be financed out to seven years total. 
uh, machine or equipment can be financed up to 15 years of useful life. And real estate can um, be financed out to 30 years. You know, it can be a blend of all three of those uses of, um, of um, you know, uh, needs. And uh, we just blend that, uh, that loan term as well. Now, these are the maximums of USDA rural development. Your particular lender, your particular bank, they, they may have different maxes. So they may say, well, uh, we can only go to 25 years out on real estate loans, and we can only do 12 years on machinery and equipment loans. That's fine. That's their, ultimately, they have the say-so on the term as long as they don't go past the maximums that you see uh, listed here. <clears throat> Our programs do have equity requirements, um, which um, so um, on, a, on a new startup business, it means that you need to have a 20% minimum balance sheet equity um, in the business. So you're not gonna be able to borrow, um, you know, 100% of the financing on a new business uh, because, you know, you gotta have some type of injection that can either be cash, it might, you know, you may be building a building, but the business, the owners of the business bought land to inject into the business, so um, so that would count as as part of the the injection. But there the, there does have to be some type of injection on a new business uh, to meet that 20% uh, tangible balance sheet equity. Now, an existing business has to have a minimum of a 10% balance sheet equity. In a case of an existing business, um, if they're already up and operating and they own, you know, their assets or have a good portion of their assets paid off, they may come in with a new project and be able to finance 100% of that new project because they already have existing equity built up in their business. So it's just something you have to talk to your lender about and, and figure out where you stand on those types of things. But, uh, but that's kind of the rule that we're we're a task to abide by there as far as equity is concerned. And then all of our equity calculations are, are made in accordance with generally account, accepted accounting principles is uh, something to always keep in mind. We're, we're looking at good, uh, good accounting uh, policies and principles. You know, we, we uh, on that equity calculation, we don't give credit for things like goodwill and, and, uh, and other inflated values of assets. We have to go by the accounting principles. Um, everyone's always concer concerned about their interest rates on the loan that they get. Um, you know, it can, in our program, it can be a fixed rate or it can be a variable rate. It's going to be something that the business negotiates uh, with the uh, lender. Um, and the lender is going to determine, decide what kind of interest rate they're going to be able to give their borrower. We don't dictate um, what their interest rate will be. We only ask the lender that they use a... Uh, a similar and customary rate uh, with their, their guaranteed customer as they would use with any other customer. Um, if it is a variable rate, so we ask the lender that they don't change that rate more than quarterly, which you know, no more than four times per year. <clears throat> so um, that's um, that covers all of the, the the main points of our business and industry guaranteed loan that I was. I was wanting to mention, uh, like I say, we're going to have an opportunity for questions at the end if, if there was anything I, uh, you would like further clarification on. And of course, as always, you're always welcome to call our office and talk about specifics of your project or your business, and, and we'd always be happy to, to talk to you about that if, if you either ask a question today or, or get in touch with us later. We're, we certainly are happy to do that. Now, the second program that I'm wanting to uh, to cover with you this morning is our Rural Energy for America program. Uh, we use the acronym REAP, and you'll hear a lot about REAP, so, but the Rural Energy for America. And what it is, is it's a program that was established, established as a grant and a loan guarantee program to assist either agriculture producers or rural small businesses into purchasing uh, and installing renewable energy systems or to make energy efficiency improvements to their businesses. This is one of the few programs that uh, at Rural Development actually gets to deal with ag producers. And um, the only reason we were able to do that is because the other ag lender, uh, they don't have uh, energy efficiency programs. Uh, so, so when it comes to doing something with energy efficiency or renewable energy, um, so we, we can deal with, with both types of business, uh, you know, 
traditional business or an ag producer. So what is renewable energy technologies? You know, those are things like windmills. You know, you see the big, large wind farms. There's also small wind, uh, wind turbines that, that are, uh, you see, located on smaller farms. Uh, you know, both of those are eligible to participate in the program. Geothermal um, can be, you know, uh, those are you can be larger projects. It can be something as simple as a geothermal heat pump. Um, you know, which uses around uh, temperatures to, to to heat and cool a, a business. So uh, solar, we do a lot of solar projects. You know, installing solar panels on a solar farm to um, uh, to power a business. So um, you know, biomass things like wood pellets to to burn wood, energy in wood stoves. Uh, you know, biomass can also be some type of biodiesel or ethanol type project. Those are all considered to be bioenergy projects. Um, and hydrogen, some uh, hydrogen and hydroelectric, those are a little more obscure. We don't see too many of those projects. And then a, another area that we see a lot of activity in is our energy efficiency. So if you own a business and you've got a 30 year old heat and air system that's going out, you're going to have to replace that. Any new system that you purchase to replace that with is going to be an energy efficient uh, system compared to what you're replacing. So with this program, you know you can you can um, you can replace that war old worn out piece of equipment and then uh, have the possibility of getting a 25 percent grant to help offset the cost of that new system. You know the, uh, uh, a grocery store might be uh, installing um, you know new freezers uh, that are more energy efficient. They may be putting in. LED energy efficient lighting and may replace, be replacing windows and doors. All those things would be types of things that a business could do that to be more energy efficient. That, that could be something that falls in this program, and they could get a, a grant to reimburse some of those costs on. Um, you know, in ag, uh, ag we see a lot of poultry houses replacing lighting, insulation. Uh, I mentioned heat and air. You know, we see farmers replacing irrigation motors, diesel motors. They'll replace those with electric motors because they're more efficient. Um, we see them uh, upgrading their dry, grain dryers um, you know, uh, to be more more energy efficient. Uh, commercial businesses, again, heat and air, coolers, lighting, uh, all those types of things are, are types of projects that fall under this. Um, so here's just one example for irrigation motor replacement, uh, replacing an old inefficient uh, uh, diesel motor with a new electric motor. Um, you know, let's say the total project cost was $50,000. Uh, um, you know, of uh, the grant amount reimbursement on that could be 12,500. That's a pretty significant amount of money that that farmer's getting back for making that, uh, that energy efficiency improvement. Um, you know, and then, uh, then there's just 37,500 uh, expended there, and and with the um, with the new efficiencies of that electric motor, you know that project makes pay for itself in a, uh, two to three years. So uh, so it it really can be you know that money in that farmer's pocket after that two year period, and he gets that that uh, that motor paid off, then then he's just saving that much money every year after that. So it can be really really good project for that. So who's eligible for this uh, program? Again, I mentioned agricultural producers, uh, regardless of where they're located. Uh, small businesses are located in a population area of less than 50,000, like we talked about a while ago. Um, the applicants have to be a private entity, uh, either a sole proprietorship, partnership, or corporation, uh, can be a cooperative. Um, agricultural producer and those rural small businesses, uh, again, the, the Thing is here, nonprofit organizations and public bodies are not eligible to participate in the program. So, um, um, so it does have to be a private, for-profit type business to be eligible uh, to participate in the program. Um, you know, projects that are eligible again, projects to make improvements to an existing energy system or to update a system. Again, uh, things that are working with any kind of dryer or electric motor, any kind of heating and cooling. You know, those are things that you could update or improve or make uh, upgrades to to be more energy efficient. Um, 
the technology used has to be commercially available and commercially known technology. I, you know, I like to tell people it can't be something that your, your brother-in-law Bubba invented out in his garage that he thinks will save money. It's got to be something that we can go back to and get data on and say, yes, by putting in this electric motor, you're going to save this amount of money per year. Um, you know, it's going to reduce your heating and cooling costs. It's going to make your lighting costs go down. We has to be a proven technology to be eligible for the program. It has to be technically feasible. Um, you know, so um, it, you know, just putting in some type of technology just to have it. If it's not going to save you any money, then then it really isn't going to be eligible for the program. So um, it needs to be technically feasible. Um, the applicant has to be the owner of the system. So, um, so you know, you, we have to look at who owns the business and, and who owns the, the building that the energy efficiency upgrades are going to be made to and those kind of things. And we have to make sure the applicant for the grant is the actual owner of the, of the system that we're uh, upgrading or replacing or the, who's going to be the owner of the, the solar farm, for example. Now, as far as the grants go, um, grants for energy efficiency projects can uh, be as little as $1,500. So that's a, a, a project that's at least $6,000 or more to be eligible for that $1,500 grant. The project can be, a, a, the grant amount can be up to $250,000. That would be a million dollar project. Um, now for renewable energy, the things like the solar panels or the wind turbines, those types of things, the minimum grant size on that side of the, of the aisle is a $2,500, the minimum grant, that's a, that's a $10,000 project cost to get a grant of $2,500. The maximum uh, grant can be a $500,000 grant, um, and that's a $2 million project. Obviously, that's a, a very big project. The majority of the projects, the applications that we see come in applying for these grants or towards a smaller range. Uh, the majority of the applications that we process are for, for grant requests of $20,000 or less. So, um, so you know, there's, there can be a wide variety of, of sizes there, but, uh, but smaller is typically better when you're uh, competing for grant funding. There's just so much money to go around and um, so uh, so smaller tends to be better as far as uh, projects that, that get funded. <clears throat> eligible cost. So any cost that's eligible has to be a cost that's incurred after the application is actually filed in our office. So construction expenses or expenses for any, doing your improvements uh, have to be, you know, don't start incurring expenses until after you file an application. Um, now, this program can't do, do anything residential. We can't do, so it all has to be business related, either to the ag business or to the traditional type of business, but, but nothing is going to be um, as far as making energy improvements to a home, a residential type situation. Uh, you can use funds to pay for energy audits and energy assessments, any type of permitting or licensing fees related to construction, you know, developing business plans and technical reports, architectural drawings, those types of things, any other professional service. Um, you know, those are all things that can be reimbursed with the grant program. And, it, you know, if a feasibility was studied, it was needed on some type of project, that could be an eligible project as well. Um, things that we can't do, like I mentioned, we can't do anything residential, no residential improvements. Uh, any energy efficiency improvements are related to a new construction. We can't do that. If it's an energy efficiency project, it has to be related to some existing system, some existing business, something that's already out there where we're actually in improving a situation that's already in place. Uh, we can't do any um, grants for the agriculture tillage equipment. Uh, vehicles are not eligible. Um, any applicant in-kind contribution is not eligible uh, for grant um, reimbursement or any kind of application preparation fees is not eligible for grant um, uh, as well. Now, I think the last thing I'd like to mention about this REAP program is there's also a guaranteed loan um, involved and it works very similar to the 
the business industry guaranteed loan that I described at the first um, program that we talked about when the webinar started. Um, you know, so um, so with the the um, with the guaranteed loan, so so if uh, you know between the grant and the guaranteed loan, you could finance a total of seventy five percent of a project's cost. So you get a twenty five percent grant, or another fifty percent um, for um, the the additional cost involved in making the project work. And um, um, you know those the guaranteed loan can be a maximum up to twenty five million dollars. Again, there's not really any minimum minimum. So um, so that grant um, between the grant and the guaranteed loan program, you can really do a large project. Uh, um, that that opportunity to do that is certainly there. Certainly not a requirement. Uh, we we tend to like small projects better than large projects simply because we can make our money go further. But uh, but again, we've laid out the maximums that are available in the program. With that, I'm, I've wrapped up the two programs that I'm going to talk about, and I'm going to hand it over to Steve and let him talk about the um, the value added producer grant program. Thank you, Tim. Um, I'm Steve Mosier, as as um, Tim, the moderator, um, mentioned originally um, at the beginning of the, of the webinar. I'm with the Innovation Center out of Washington, D.C., and I, I serve both Arkansas and Oklahoma, and I have the pleasure to serve two state directors, David Branscombe and Dr. Lee Denning, um, for both Arkansas and Oklahoma. But at the end of the day, um, I'm here to serve the people of Arkansas and Oklahoma. Um, Agriculture producers in America are most efficient and um, most productive in the world. And uh, this value added grant program adds um, an opportunity to um, American farmers and ranchers, um, an opportunity to, to I guess, seize um, additional money that um, sometimes is left on the table um, because of, of, I guess, um, oftentimes, agriculture products are, um, go into a, a generic pool. In today's world, people want to know where their food's coming from and uh, wants to know who their farmer is. So this this program helps with that. Um, to the, the value added grant program helps producers add value activities through processing and marketing of agriculture products. Um, it, um, it enables farmers and ranchers to expand markets and increase financial returns for agriculture producers. And at the end of the day, it strengthens rural um, economies. Um, national competition um, is required for the value added grant program. So all applications that are submitted um, are competed um, for these funds uh, on a national basis. The maximum award amounts for planning is 75,000 and for working capital is 250,000. Matching requirement is a one-to-one -one ratio or 50% of the total pro project cost. Cash um, are um, eligible in-kind contributions can be used only for eligible loan purposes. The grant period is um, a maximum of 36 months and it depends on the um, complexity of the project. The basic program requirements is applicant eligibility, project el eligibility, purpose eligibility, other eligibility requirements, and evaluation criteria. Um, an eligible ap uh, applicant eligibility, um, ap applicant type, multiple grants, um, current activity grants, and reserve funds as applicable. Four eligibility applicant types are independent producers agriculture producer groups, um, farmers are rancher cooperatives, and majority of controlled producer-based businesses. Um, any of the four types must um, currently produce um, or own more than 50% of the raw commodity that is going to be uh, used in the value-added product. Um, own a product that is in its raw commodity state through a production of value added um, production during the um, project, except for, yeah. okay. Um, value added, um, pro project eligibility, value added project met methodology, expansion of customer based and greater portion of revenues um, from the um, 
process return to the producer is the, the focal point of, of the program. Uh, five value added methodologies are um, current in um, changing the physical state um, produced in a manner that enhances the agriculture commodity, um, produced seg segregation, um, farm and ranch based renewable energy, locally produced agriculture food products. The um, purpose of the, of the program eligibility is two types of grants, use of funds and budget work or work plan. Um, project eligibility, two types of value added grants. If there's a planning um, component or planning grant, um, this pays um, for a qualified third party con consultation um, for the development of feasibility, market, uh, marketing, uh, business plans related to the processing and our marketing of value added products. And the other one is working capital grants to pay for uh, projects related to the processing and our marketing of value added, value added products. Okay. <clears throat> examples of the examples of the L, uh, of the eligible activities include but are not limited to processing costs um, including labor utilities packaging and labeling in ingredients um, add the raw commodity inventory from third parties up to 49 percent of the amount of the of the project uh, keep in mind that the producer um, the supplying for the value added grant has to be able to produce or have um, ownership of at least 50% or more. Um, advertise and promotion and um, fi financial and accounting, accounting systems. Okay. Tim, do you want to make a few comments on some projects that you've seen? Sure. Like so. So what that's saying there is is so so I'm a say I'm a wheat farmer and I've decided that. You know, instead of just taking my wheat to the elevator and selling it, I'm going to make pasta with it. So, so I, you know, I I put up a new shop building, or I clear out some space in my shop building to put in some processing equipment to where I can, I can take my my raw agriculture product, my wheat, and then I'm gonna I'm gonna grind it and make flour and 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 again you know, turn it into pasta. Well, the um, this grant's going to we used as working capital purposes, um, you know, it's going to allow me to, um, uh, to you know, again, we mentioned that it's a 50-50 match, so it's going to allow, allow me to, to, uh, to pay for half my labor and half my utilities and have my packaging, but then I get, I'll get this grant and get reimbursed for 50 percent to where the grant's paying for half of of the, the the working capital that it takes to to make this raw commodity, I mean to make this pasta. So any of my processing costs or any of my advertising and promotion or you know if I have to buy packaging and labels to put my product in, all those things are eligible where this grant can help pay for half of the cost of of those things. Now to to back up where the feasibility study might be used is you know, say I'm the wheat farmer that just had this idea and said, hey, I wonder if it would work if I wanted to, to take my uh, my wheat and make pasta and then sell that instead of just selling a raw wheat. Well, he could take get this grant and hire a consultant for them to do some market research and find out, hey, you know, you within 100 miles of your farm, we've identified 25 different businesses that would be willing to buy your product and sell it in their store or want to use your farm grown product in their restaurants. And so, yes, we think this is a viable option for you. So, so that might be their first grant. And then in the next year they turn around and apply for the grant again to get this working capital grant to be able to, to pay cost. And again, just to help the business get started, to get on its feet, help that ag help return more of the consumer dollars back to that agriculture producer's pocket. So that's the intent of the grant and that's kind of an example of how it might be used. Okay, thank you, Tim. Another thing that, uh, you know, has come to my mind, um, as a, a farmer or rancher is trying to add value to the product, they can use this value at a grant program and also work with local businesses um, to um, possibly 
in a restaurant have on their menu where it's, it's locally grown and they can actually partner together as far as the advertising and, and promotion of that. So that's another another thing that Tim they might, might, might be able to, to do. As far as any eligible activities um, for the use of funds, um, the things that we're not able to do is purchase land, buildings or equipment, uh, prepare um, preparation of the grant application, research and development, architectural or engineering design work, um, expenses for the production, harvesting and or delivery um, to the processing facility of the agriculture um, commodity or product. Other eligibility requirements, um, grant period and um, completeness of an application is, is crucial. Uh, the um, NOFA that was out on this program came out on December the um, 11th, I believe. That sounds about right. And the uh, deadline is um, March um, 10th. 10th. Yeah. Thank you. Um, grant period, uh, maximum is 36 months in length um, from the time of the award. Um, note, uh, this is not an open-ended. Um, each year, um, the grant period is based on the project's complexity and indicates the um, application work plan. And each year, there is a NOFA that comes out that um, announces when the uh, window of application time is. Um, extensions are up to 12 months, can, could be considered only if unavoidable and unforeseen circumstances occur. Uh, note that any grant may exceed 36 months, therefore no extension is available for grants a 36-month period. So Steve, that just means that, you know, somebody might have applied for the working capital grant and thought they were going to get their business started and they were going to be able to use all those grant funds within 18 months and well, say they they uh, suffered some type of delay and it took a little bit longer. So at the end of that 18, first 18 month period, they weren't quite finished, they hadn't spent all their money. So we could go up and give them up to an additional 18 months to where, you know, as long as it didn't extend past 36 months, we can give them more time to finish their project. We don't give them 36 months to start with if it, they really only need 12 months, but, but we can extend when we need to. Okay, thank you. Um, Tim, one other thing I want to make sure that we mention is um, would you comment on the DUNS number and SAMS? I know that's the first thing that an applicant needs to um, get taken care of um, prior to starting on their application. Right. Um, yeah, there's a few things I'd like to mention. And, and right now you can see my contact uh, information and Laura Tucker, who works in my office's contact information. Um, and either one of us can help you. But uh, uh, in the application process, every applicant for a federal program has to have a DUNS number um, and um, has to go through the SAMS registration. Um, you know, in the application material that you're given, it'll tell you what the, how to take care of that process. Um, my suggestion is anyone that's, that's um, thinking about filing for an application, whether it be a REAP application or a value-added producer grant, or in case of the uh, BNI guaranteed loan, we would ask you to have your lender contact our office uh, for sure. But get in touch with, with somebody at, at USDA Rural Development up front. Let us give you the application information. Let us tell you, let us work with you to make sure you understand the process of of going through getting your DUNS number and your SAMS registration, and we can assist you if you're having any problems or, or if you're needing any any assistance like that. You know, there's if you wind up getting to the wrong website on, especially trying to get a DUNS number or SAMS registration, if you type .com instead of .gov, you can you can land on a site that that they try to look like they're the government, but they're not. They're going to try to scam you out of money. So. So we want to help make sure you get to the right sites to do these different registrations. It should never cost you any money to register for these things or, or to apply for, a, you know, one of these loans that we've talked about uh, or grants that we've talked about. So it's so real important to just touch base with your local office uh, or with your with our state office or if you're in a different state, you know, the state, uh, the people that are running the program in, that, in your state where we can we can help assist you get the right application information and get you pointed in the right direction. And Tim, I work with Tommy Earls out of Oklahoma, and I know we have some participants on the line 
um, from Oklahoma, but Tommy and his staff will also work with the uh, right. uh, clients, just like like you and Laura will. So mm -hmm. I want to mention that. I guess we need to look at the chat box and see if we have any questions. Yeah, I think we're looking at it. All right, good job, guys. Um, right now we don't have any questions, but I do want to remind everybody you can submit questions to uh, Tim and Steve using the uh, the chat box there at the bottom. And uh, while we're waiting for folks to kind of gather their thoughts, I do want to remind everybody today's webinar is being brought to you by the <clears throat> Arkansas Small Business and Technology Development Center. And in particular, our office at Arkansas uh, Technical Tech University there in Westville, Arkansas. Uh, Steve and uh, Tim have uh, actually dropped by our center or sitting there in the center itself with our uh, director, Rhonda Hawkins. And uh, we appreciate uh, everybody coming in uh, doing this uh, webinar for you today, the chance to host that. I'm still not showing any questions at this end. I'm sure somebody's got a question about a project or something that they'd like to fund. So now's your chance to tap into the expertise with uh, Tim and Steve. <laughs> 